Welcome back to the Plenteous Redemption podcast. Thank you for taking the time to listen to these ideas and and for taking the time to consider them. This broadcast is another extension of the essays written on our website. Those essays can be found at plenteousredemption.com. We'll also leave a link in the description below. Of course, as I record this, you may hear cars pass by from time to time. I'm uh, My wife and I are on deputation to raise the monetary support. We need to go to Uganda, Africa as missionaries, and we're kind of in limbo at the moment. A friend of ours has provided us a, a, a wonderful place to stay temporarily until we allow the Corona blues to, <laughs> to pass by us and figure out what's going to happen next. So till then, I've taken up my time with doing some more writing and recording and just trying to put in, implement some ideas, put into practice some ideas that I've had in my mind for a while, just have not really been able to to really sit down and plan out and and put into practice. So that's where these broadcasts have uh, begun to come from, and and that is the purpose for them. If you would, just keep in mind that this is under the heading, The Cross and the Culture, on our website, plenteousredemption.com. They exist for the purpose of discussing certain cultural issues from a fundamental Bible-believing perspective. That is that is our purpose in, in uh, discussing these things and approaching some of these, these cultural issues. For the broadcast, Lord willing, we'll dive into expository Bible teaching, but for now, we will take up our time with these essays from a cultural perspective. And this is primarily going to be with Western culture and even more specifically American culture. And in the future, Future, when I am situated in Uganda, Africa, I hope up to I hope to take up a, a similar series of essays that would deal with African culture and even more specifically, of course, Ugandan culture. Also, we'll do a lot of work, Lord willing, in Rwanda, and it would be wonderful to be able to express to the world the current condition of Rwanda. People that that know of Rwanda, typically what they think of is the Rwandan genocide of 1994. And indeed, if you try and search Rwanda on the internet, 99% of what you're going to find is going to be about the Rwandan genocide. Rwanda has become the safest, most secure, most prosperous country in all of Africa. And there's much to be said about it. And and uh, while it has great spiritual needs, it's its current status of security and, and economic growth has been wonderful. Now, it, it'll remain to be seen what the coronavirus and, and this world shutdown does in, in that part of East Africa. Currently, Rwanda is a, is a thriving nation and doing very well. We hope in the future to be able to bring you these types of uh, cultural essays and lectures or discussions based around cultural ideas and problems from a biblical perspective when I get on that side of the ocean, if you would pray about those things, that would be a blessing and a help. So let's let's get started. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. That is Psalm 94, verse 11. Perpetual performance anxiety now dominates many in our world. The trouble is we are not dealing with reasonable forms of performance, such as public speaking or a musical performance or sports performance or, or your career, or um, we're not talking in terms here of, of something reasonable that comes with a lot of pressure, that comes with a lot of much is required of you. Instead, we're dealing with something very unreasonable and unnecessary. The pressures involved with performing well are very real and can become a, a heavy load to carry. But allowing such pressures to exist in unreasonable fashion is the trouble to which I am alluding. Social media creates a form of performance anxiety in which individuals of the selfie generation compete against themselves. Social media, to some extent, is providing an atmosphere for young people to become their own worst enemies. With, vi with viral hopes, one selfie after another is offered to the social media gods. Now, that's our topic today. It's dealing with this idea of the selfie generation, a generation of people that have become so self-absorbed that even when given the opportunity to present themselves in a certain way online, what they want you to see is a picture taken from the length of their arm by their own hand staring back at their own face. No one willing to take the picture for them, no one caring enough to take the picture for them, or they're not involved in depth enough in a relationship for someone to, to be around to take that picture for them. There are a number of problems here, a number of issues here. And this might seem petty, 
it might seem like a non-issue, but I, I hope to demonstrate to you through this discussion, through this essay, that, that it's not. It is very real. It's very serious. It's very problematic. And it is something I hope you will look at in your own life and take some consideration thereof. Now, maybe the first one goes viral or even the first couple. But the trouble comes when the, when, when the social media titans who so admired that perfect selfie no longer takes interest. The competition begins and performance anxiety follows. The desire of the selfie generation is to gain victory over the vicious circle of self-deception, leading them to believe they can regain the number of likes they once achieved. And that's where, that's where it comes in. That's where the trouble lies. First of all, you were so enamorated with yourself that you felt the world needed to see see what you see. And so you, you take the time to take a selfie. Now, I understand I, I've done it before. Probably most people in the world at this point have done it to, some, to one extent or another at this point. I don't think there's an issue with someone holding their camera out and taking a picture of themselves once or twice. But when you do go onto someone's social media feed and all you see is selfie after selfie after selfie, there's a problem. I would say that they are subject to these these type these type issues. Just as a heroin addict seeks their fix, the social media addict seeks that flood of dopamine to temporarily relieve their depression or anxiety. This may seem like a silly proposition, but this routine dominates the lives of many. At times it fully controls them. Just as the drug of choice dominates the behavior of the addict, psychologists have asserted that social media is as deadly as the drugs that flood our streets. That's a very interesting suggestion. I think it's a very true suggestion. I think it's a very real problem. Psychologists have suggested the effects of social media and the lives of millions is equivalent to drug abuse. If social media were a pill that could be consumed, it would have been made illegal and rehab centers would be springing up around the country right now. The selfie generation is, to some extent, a product of the self-esteem doctrine. And this is a doctrine the world loves. It covets this idea that you're supposed to esteem yourself. Their entire lives, they have been told, if you would just esteem yourself or believe in yourself, then all would be well. If you would just believe in your heart, then one emotional trouble after the other would fall, never to rise again. Proponents of these foolish ideas often give me a perplexed look when I ask them, would you tell Charles Manson to believe in his heart or to believe in himself or to esteem himself? Would you tell Jeffrey Dahmer that he should just he should just follow the desires of his heart, that he should he should have a higher self-esteem? I think they did follow the desires of their heart. I think that was the problem. The Bible says your heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. So this is this is a, a dire situation. It's very problematic. You know, if Charles Manson had only esteemed himself more highly, maybe he never would have turned out to be the sadistic leader of a death cult. <laughs> of course, we know such, such a philosophy does not work due to its unbiblical nature. Now, why would I suggest it's unbiblical to, to believe in yourself or it's unbiblical to esteem yourself or to have a higher self-esteem? Well, the Bible is very clear. And if you consider it from a, from a biblical perspective and let the Bible speak, in Philippians 2, 3, the Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lonely, lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And that's, that's the problem. It's directly contrary to biblical truth. When you're told to esteem yourself, what you're being told to do is to violate the word of God and to place yourself above others when the word of God very clearly tells us and teaches us you are to put others ahead of yourself. Others come first, you come second. But when you when you invert that and you flip that around and you place yourself first and others others behind that, you become very detached from this world. You become very detached from reality. You fall into states of depression. You have anxiety. You have a number of psychological and emotional problems that stem from not getting your orientation to the people around you correct all the while the people around you and the people in this world are telling you to continue to maintain that disoriented relationship. <laughs> it's madness and it's backwards. Now, this doctrine fails primarily because of its unbiblical nature. It is necessary to try and establish some specifics rather than simply making dogmatic statements. I, I think that's important. I can dogmatically tell you that for you to tell me I am to esteem myself and, and not take into consideration the esteem of others, 
is is unbiblical. That's a dogmatic statement. But I, I believe we could pro- provide some proof of that. The idea of esteeming self at no point takes into account the individual person. Anyone, regardless of a complete lack of character or accomplishment, is encouraged to esteem self. Some of you, that's going to be hard for you, for some of you to take and to understand or to grasp. And it's going to sound mean or bigoted to you. And it's not at all. My stepfather, my stepfather is a very good man. He used to say to me, because I, I had a, a, a uh, I, I was problematic. I was troublesome as a teenager and as a young man. He used to say to me, why are you so prideful? You haven't done anything to be proud of. <laughs> now, at the time, that was not very exciting for me to hear. And I didn't take it very well. Looking back on it now, it made unbelievably perfect sense. If you haven't accomplished anything in life, what is there to esteem? And if you are not a productive member of society in some way, what is there to esteem? And when you continually try to esteem something that is not worth, that is not worth the amount of esteem you've placed upon it, that lack of reality is damaging. It's harmful. It's not helpful. It further detaches the person from reality. And instead of having a form of esteem that is based upon that which is real, something they may have accomplished, something they may have done, some real means of establishment or estimation, what ends up happening is they're esteeming something or someone that really doesn't have that amount of worth. Now, I'm not saying that human life is void of worth. That's not, that's not where we're going here. That's not, we're not talking about whether, whether a human life it has any estimation We'll get to that in a second. We're going to talk about the value of, of human life in a moment. I'm talking about me as an individual doing everything I can to esteem myself when I know I've done nothing to deserve that amount of esteem, of self-worth, of self, self-promotion, self of self-love. And the further away from my estimation that reality is, the more confused and the more depressed and the more frustrated we become. You've got to close that gap. It's not a bad thing to understand you've not accomplished anything in life. It's only bad when you understand it and don't submit to it and do something about it. When you just pretend like that doesn't exist, now you've got a problem. When you just continue on as though that doesn't matter, now you've got a problem. But when you recognize finally that the choices I've made have been problematic and the choices I've made have caused me to go nowhere. And that is why I'm depressed. And that is why I'm upset. And that's why I don't see any real value in my life. Then at that point, it's time to do something about it. And just pretending that you can esteem where you are is not doing something about it. That's making the problem worse. You actually want to get up and begin to accomplish something. Clean your room, make your bed, get a job. Be the best employee at whatever job it is that that company has. If it's flipping burgers at McDonald's, you make sure that they have never seen someone flip burgers so well. You want to be good at what you're doing. You want to provide value from your life, not just pretend there is value in your life. And again, we're not talking about, we're not talking, you have to separate this from the idea of, of the overall worth of a human being. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the value of your production in society and the world around you and placing a false estimation on that value is what we're talking about here. These people, they, they, they live life subject to their impulses, freely given over to the lust of their flesh. And this, of course, leads to, a disa- to disastrous outcomes of which the consequences can be very serious. Rather than receiving proper instruction concerning the destructive nature of their choices, they are told to believe in themselves. And, and again, that... That is the problem. You had a choice. You could have taken instruction that would have allowed you to correct the problem in your life, or you could just pretend that there are no problems. You can just pretend that you're satisfied with where you are. Not only are you satisfied with it, you're going to esteem it as though it is a good place to be in life. When you place such falsehoods upon the value of where you are, you're you're really going to become disillusioned. You're really going to have a lot of problems. And the sooner you get past all this, the better your life will be. Now, this course leads to disastrous outcomes of which the consequences can be very serious. Rather than receiving proper instruction concerning the destructive nature of their choices, they are told to believe in themselves. It's a terrible idea to encourage someone that demonstrates destructive patterns of behavior to believe in themselves or to esteem themselves. Correction is essential. 
Furthermore, correction is not unloving or hateful. It's exactly contrary to that. Correction is is one of the most loving things you can do. If you are someone that has been successful and you are someone that is that has excelled in life and 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 done something to actually be proud of or or to esteem or to have some value in your life, it's not wrong for you to point out to someone else that they are not where you are and they are not where you are because they have not put the proper effort and work into it. Now, if you're just going around boasting about where you are, that's a whole nother problem that maybe we'll talk about another day. You should be continually reviewing your life and attempting to determine the the current estimate and the current value of where you are. That is extremely important. You don't want to just kind of float through life and let it go where it wants. You want to set goals. You want to try and achieve those goals. You want to measure your life and what's going on in your life upon the accomplishment of those goals and whatever those goals are, the value of those goals. This is what gives your life meaning and allows you to kind of project yourself forward in a proper direction rather than just floating nowhere, doing nothing, but pretending that everything is okay. That's a problem. And if you're good at these things. Look, someone that has greatly helped me with this is my pastor, James Knox. He's very good at setting goals and then setting objective measures for those goals and then and then working to obtain and to achieve those goals, whether it's little by little on a daily basis or whether it's a, a hard, concentrated effort. It depends on the situation. But he he gets so much done. It blows my mind at all the things he's able to accomplish in a year's time but it's because he stays focused and he works hard. And so there's estimation in that. There's value in that. Now, he's also a very humble man. He doesn't go around boasting about these things. He doesn't go around bragging about these things. Uh, I think people brag and boast more for him than he does for himself. (laughs) And that's fine. That's biblical. The Bible says to let other men boast on your behalf, but that's not his goal. That's not his aim. His aim is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to continue to be productive in the, in in those terms. And so he sets goals and he works hard to reach those goals to make sure that he's continually progressing. To fail to do that is really going to cause problems in your life. It'll get you caught up in this world of social media and twiddling your thumbs doing absolutely nothing. So correction is essential. Instructing someone to esteem self or believe in self when self has been repeatedly destructive is in essence enabling and consenting toward that person's behavior. And we don't want to do that. We want to help steer someone in the right direction. We don't want to encourage them to move in the wrong direction or to stay in the wrong place. And so correction is needed. As a result, the person never gets the help they need. Instead, uh, the vicious circle that is their life turns into a cyclone of sorts, leaving destruction in its path. To sit and do nothing with your life is more problematic than the outcome of, of nothing happening. If, if that's all it was, was that all you would do at the end of your life was have done nothing, that, that would be one thing. But that's not what happens. People tend to, they go from accomplishing nothing to going backwards. It becomes, it goes, it, it becomes, instead of being productive, they become destructive. And instead of having a life of fulfillment and meaning and purpose and duty and accomplishing things and doing something great in this world, whatever that may be, in terms of what I'm speaking of, doing something great and the duty and the accomplishment would be directly related to service to Jesus Christ. You may hear this and think of something else, and that's fine. My aim is to point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever motivational purpose this may have to help help drag you out of a place of depression or anxiety or or just just a situation where you're not accomplishing anything in life, well, praise the Lord. I, I'd be excited about that. But you don't want to encourage destructive behavior in someone because that attitude of doing nothing is going to be harmful. They're going to end up living off of someone else. They're going to end up living off of society in general. They're going to end up becoming uh, uh, depressed, which has a, an, an entire array of troubles that come along with that. They're going to have this anxiety that builds up in their lives, which has an, another entire uh, sorts of, of troubles that come along with that. Uh, there's all sorts of problems that come with esteeming yourself when you're not doing anything to have earned that type of esteem. It, it comes with a, with a world of problems that, that will end up causing you to descend into destruction 
in your life and the life of those around you in the life of your society. This has bigger problems than you just deciding to be a deadbeat. People I know and love have been ravaged by drug addiction. Many attempts have been made to help them escape their chosen lifestyle. And it is a chosen lifestyle. It's not a disease. It didn't just spring on them suddenly. A life of drug addiction, it is the end result of a series of choices, personal choices. But social media provided for them an avenue to continue. That's very important to understand. One person in particular that I, I sure wish I could talk to tonight and wish I could help tonight and wish would listen to me and uh, or wish would listen to someone that's willing to help them. They don't want to and they won't listen because the moment they leave your presence, they're on a phone, they're on a tablet, they're on a computer. They are immediately jumping onto social media and making contact with people that will help them continue in their destructive lifestyle, though they may have given you indication that we're on the same page and we're moving in the right direction. You wake up the next morning and they're long gone back out in the streets doing exactly what they were doing before and never had any intention of stopping. Or if they did have intention of stopping the moment they got on social media, they got in touch with that crowd or those people that encouraged them to stick with it, <laughs> stick with drug addiction. It's very destructive, very destructive. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible pattern that doesn't have to exist, but it's going to take some personal discipline. It's going to take you and me and the world around us receiving some instruction and some correction to try and break these patterns. Now, ideas such as esteeming self and believing in self assisted them with continuing their addiction. It never occurred to them something was wrong with them or their choices because they esteemed themselves so highly. And they've been taught to esteem themselves so highly. The Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It bears repeating. Had Charles Manson esteemed the other people in his life higher than himself, we may not have had those brutal murders that have stained American history. The self-esteem doctrine is a, is a complete failure. Social media is overwhelming proof of this fact. The selfie generation does not suffer from low self-esteem, but rather they highly esteem themselves. Have you, been on, have you been online and just looked around online? People don't have trouble esteeming themselves. They think very highly of themselves. The way they project themselves on social media is clear evidence of that. Very rarely do you find someone online willing to be honest about the current state of their life. Social media is overwhelming proof of this fact. The selfie generation does not suffer from low self-esteem but rather they highly esteem themselves. The term selfie alone exemplifies the fact that esteeming self is not the trouble. The exact opposite is true. They highly esteem themselves and social media is the canvas whereby they express that estimation. The trouble comes when the world around them fails to echo that same level of estimation. They can't understand why you don't see, why you don't see how high they esteem themselves, why you don't see the same thing. Why you don't respond the way that they, they think you should respond. You don't like what they think you should like on their, on their different uh, uh, platforms of social media, the different pictures they post, the things they say, the, the ways in which they act on these different platforms. They believe you owe them a certain amount of response and estimation that equals the estimation they have in themselves. And they just can't understand why you would not see what they see. This vicious cycle of vain activity is now proving to have very serious consequences. Studies are now showing that since 2010, the number of suicides in people from age 24 and under has increased by 31%. In these studies, social media is considered the reason or was at least related. Something as silly as a selfie alongside a doctrine as presumably well-meaning as self-esteem is resulting in self-mutilation or suicide. Social media platforms are intentionally created to exemplify vanity and envy. A quick search online will demonstrate many of these platforms purposefully created a system that was addictive in nature. Interviews with certain social media engineers allow them to explain openly they had two choices regarding the build-out of various social media platforms. One choice was properly curated and non-addictive, the second choice would promote negativity and would be highly addictive. 
Of course, according to their own admission, they chose the addictive route. A few of the engineers that helped to start what our pastor calls face plant, <laughs> they can be found online giving interviews explaining that they, they would never allow their families to use the social media platform they helped to create. They explain in detail how that they had a choice to make. They could have created a platform that was non-addictive, that could be properly curated so that, that uh, proper rules are enforced and healthy activity would take place on these platforms. But they chose instead to, to go with a, very, a more controversial-based, addictive platform. And that's what you have today on most of your social media platforms. They are meant to be addictive. That is the purpose. Rather than face the realities of life through the social support groups that could be physically encountered, meaning family, real friends, school teachers, churches, et cetera, whatever it is you may be involved in, the, individual, the individuals of the, of the selfie generation have become isolated in an online fantasy world. This online world promotes participation in vain activity and pushes envious behavior. It's this envious social behavior that becomes so addicting. That's what people, you ever seen someone that begins to aggravate someone in a certain way just so they could see the reaction, just for the purpose of getting a reaction out of them? That's that envious behavior. That, that's what's happening here on, so, on social media platforms. This helps to keep the individual isolated and hooked on a digital world of self Absorption. Social media platforms use envy as a weaponized tool to condition the user for addiction. As the perceived vanity of their life is realized by seeing the perceived success of others, envy begins to dominate their thoughts. Now, that, that's an important sentence. I, I want you to think about that. The, the two ideas there are the perceived vanity of your life versus the perceived success of the lives of others. And it's, it's extremely important that you understand it that way, the perception, because social media allows you to create a perception about your life that may or may not be true at all. People will be online, they will scroll through their feeds of whatever platform it may be, and everybody looks so happy, and everybody's having so much fun, and everybody's doing all these great and wonderful things. And the reality is you have no idea what's going on in that person's life. Many of these people are miserable and upset, and they're just trying to project to you an image that is not real. And then when you become upset or you start to have some troubles and you jump online to take a look at what's going on and you begin to find out that everybody else in the world is happy except for you. And, and all of this is perception. None of it is real. But then you begin to react to it and it begins to build in you. And you begin to think about your life in terms of what you've seen online rather than what's really going on around you. And you have to separate the two. It is extremely important that you, you divide what's real in your life from what is online. What's online is not real. But as envy builds, it turns to aggression. Eventually, it will manifest itself in the form of an attack, either on the person they have become envious of, and, and by way of negative rants online, threats of violence online, or actually seeking out the person and harming them, or an attack on themselves, and this unfortunately is also a physical attack, typically, by way of self-mutilation, deep depression, anxiety, and too common now, suicide. All this from taking a, a few selfies and playing around online. Doesn't seem like a big deal. Seems like just a little matter. It's just, it's just, you know, it's just a little time online. What do you, what do you, what's the big deal? What's the problem? Well, apparently it's a big problem. And more and more studies are coming out. And, and I'm not going to link to any of these studies because some of the language, some of the backgrounds of some of the people are, are, are these are things I don't want to promote. But it's not hard if you do a little research and you, you search it out for yourself. It wasn't difficult for me to find this information and begin to study it out. And the people providing it are very credible. This is not some series of online rants, which we'll get to that in a moment based on bad information. We'll, we'll discuss that in just a moment as well. But these are credible psychologists that have done in-depth studies. What they are finding is that this is very problematic. We have a big problem here. And it has so infected our society and our culture. I don't know how we turn back other than 
you and I on an individual basis making some proper choices. Now, this idea of social media being used to exploit negative human characteristics is now common knowledge. More than a few individuals involved in the creation of larger social media platforms forms openly admit they were created to manipulate and control users. Short-term dopamine fixes produce social isolation, antisocial behavior, self-love, envious behavior, widespread misinformation, so on. I mean, it just, it could go on and on. The misinformation is really frustrating. The suicides and self-mutilation is heartbreaking. But the way that millions of people can be swayed by misinformation is really frustrating. You know, anti-vaccination rants, political rants, climate change rants. I mean, that list could go on and on. The number of things that people go on rants about spreading bad information. They're passionate about something that may or may not even be true. Uh, Bad information spreads quickly. The more controversial it is, the faster it will spread. The individuals spreading the information are typically ill-informed, having found the bad information online themselves. This is what happens. Someone that already does not properly look into things as they should goes online and finds a certain amount of information. They take no time to verify the, the reliability of the information, the credibility of the person that produced the information. And then they go and they post it on social media and begin to spread it and rant about it. And it creates an entire wave of people that, that go on to spread it like a virus. <laughs> it infects people and it's unfortunate. And bad information spreads quickly. The more controversial it is, the faster it will spread. Online, they are allowed to express themselves with a complete lack of sobriety, and it will be rewarded by masses of susceptible people wasting their lives on social media. You don't have to present yourself in a clear and intelligent way. You don't have to face any real discussion about the matter. You just blast the internet with it, and you can be as crazy with it as you want to be. And as a matter of fact, the more controversial you'll present it, and the more of a controversial way you present it, the, the more it will spread across across the internet, the faster it will spread. And it will become common knowledge, though it may or may not be true whatsoever. Social media uses short-term signals of valueless rewards to lead in certain directions of desired manipulation. And that's important for you to know. I don't want to get ahead of myself and I don't want to be redundant, which I, I have a problem with doing because all these thoughts pop into my head when I read some of these things. And And I began to recall some of the thoughts I had as I was writing it. Just because something becomes popular, again, as we'll see in just a moment, doesn't mean it was true or even that it was good. It just means you had enough people willing, enough people wasting their life online on social media, willing to repost it, willing to follow it, willing to to spread it as though it were true. Likes, comments, and interactions of sorts are used to conflate popularity and value. Let me repeat that. Likes, comments, and interactions of sorts are used to conflate popularity and value. And there becomes this big disparity between the two. You have that which is popular, but if you really sat down and examined the value of that which had become popular, you may find out it it really shouldn't have been there in the first place. These short-term rewards, coupled with the idea of self-esteem, further confuse the perceived self-value of information and of individuals that were already frail. People are already upset, angst, disturbed. They, they already have enough emotional and, and personal problems to add the craziness that's online. You could save yourself a lot of stress and a lot of uh, unnecessary issues by refraining from these things. Social media by design intentionally encourages controversy. The the reward system promotes aggressive and controversial posts. There is little to no reward on these platforms whatsoever for moral or intellectual content. Anything that would be properly stimulating or would make you uh, properly think of life from a a proper direction and and, and, uh, essentially motivate you to do something well or do something right or to get offline and do something, it goes nowhere. But the more crazy it is, the more controversial it is, it'll shoot to the top of the charts. Clickbait will always run away with the numbers, which of course encourages fake, shallow, aggressive, or controversial behavior online. It encourages someone to to post that which is crazy. 
if if that's what's gonna if that's what's gonna boost the dopamine signals in my head, if I if I get a fix of sorts off of getting likes and comments and seeing what I post online shared and spread and 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 all these different you know all these different interactions that take place. And if what gains those things is something controversial, then what I'm gonna do is be as controversial as I can just so I can be spread across the internet. And you have lots of people in a race to do that. Lots of people have been made famous to date simply because they were controversial, not because they did anything true or good or honest or with integrity. The result has been mass psychological illness in societies that heavily use social media. Whatever your opinion on psychology, I have my own and little of it is good, but Often great studies can be found that provide objective measures for extant troubles. We need someone that's looking into these things that can at least provide data. Even from a Bible-believing perspective, if a psychologist can at least do an honest study and I can sit down and I can look at it and determine what the fruit of whatever it is I'm getting involved in may be, I can from an objective standpoint say this is good or this is bad and know why rather than just going on a dogmatic rant about nothing. Right now, the studies are showing social media has been very harmful to the societies that use them. There are reportedly 2 billion social media users in the world, many of whom will to some extent be caught up in the illness of the selfie mentality. They're, they will suffer to, to one extent or another from the, the various emotional troubles that come about from too much use of social media. Recent studies are showing that social media is facilitating this sickness to some extent intentionally. They need that ad- ad- addictive measure. They, they need that to exist in order for you to continue coming back. That's the trouble with drugs. It has an addictive aspect to it that makes people want to go back. Just like the drug, you could choose to stop, but p- many people won't. Many people won't even take this serious enough to even consider it. Under this manipulative use of social media, the lines between truth and popularity have intentionally become blurred. That's important to understand. That that line has to be blurred. It can't, you can't have a reward system for truth on social media or social media will quickly become, um, people will become detached from that, from the aspect of social media that makes it so addictive. That's important. An idea presented on a social media platform may quickly become popular, though it may clearly be false. In like manner, the truth may be presented, but because it is unpopular, truth gains no reward nor grounds for influence. In our shallow, self-esteem-driven society, popularity then becomes desired over truth. Therefore, that which is popular becomes the social media world's truth. So they substitute truth for popularity. It doesn't matter if it's not true. Will this get a lot of clicks? Will this get a lot of comments? Will this get a lot of uh, likes? Will it get it? Will it get, get a lot of shares? Will this get spread across the internet? The value of it and measure of truth is not important. It needs to be maybe mixed with enough truth and controversy to get get it to do what I need it to do. But we can't place the value on truth. And if you do place the value on truth, it won't become popular. This, of course, is motivational for shallow people with no biblical foundation. I keep using that word shallow. That may sound, sound insulting to some of you, but it is very shallow. It's very empty. There's no worth or value there. And, and to continue in that direction to continue in those things is to participate in a very shallow and empty life. This also motivates people who so esteem themselves. They are certain you need to hear what they have to say. Once that false estimation has been placed upon me, then the idea becomes I can be loud and I can be brutish and I can, I can be a, as, as much of a scoffer online as I want to be because people need to hear what I have to say. And again, not because it's true, not because it's helpful, not because it would, would help someone's life or, or correct someone and move them in the right direction. I just want to, I just want to be popular. I just want the dopamine fix. I just want to be rewarded for my controversy. This has proven to be an epidemic of sorts that will have dire consequences on a larger scale than we have already seen. Selfies compose some 60% of all interaction on social media platforms to date. 
As my wife and I travel on deputation, we often notice a car next to us awkwardly encroaching into our lane. As we move closer to the driver, we, we stare into the window of the car, hoping to gain the satisfaction of learning why they are driving so erratically. When we learn the driver put lives on the line for a selfie, our curiosity turns to frustration. I'm sure we have no real need or concern. Airbags work great at 70 miles per hour. But besides this, what's a few deaths on the highway when, when a selfie needs to be taken? That should not exist. That should not be a problem that people have to deal with. You see a car swerving on the highway and you pull up next to it to see what's going on and find out that they are trying to take a selfie, not paying attention to where they're driving or what they're doing. They need at that point in time at 70 miles per hour on the interstate, they need to take a picture so they can post it online. That's, that's, <laughs> well, I'll let you decide what that is. Matter of fact, you feel free to leave a comment about what you think that is. <laughs> Six out of every 10 interactions on social media exists for self-indulgence. This is a serious problem. My, my warning to you reading this is to either cancel all social media or greatly reduce it. One of the two should be a priority for you. My wife and I have turned off all social media update notific notifications to our phones and computers. I have it set so that my, my various social media platforms cannot send a notification to my phone. Before I did that, I would get all these random notifications from the various platforms and I would click on it, open it up, find out that the notification had absolutely nothing to do with me. It was only there for the purpose of getting me to get onto the platform. That's the only reason for it. And then once I'm there, well, let me scroll through for a few minutes and then a few minutes turn into more minutes. And then now, you know, 30 minutes, an hour is wasted of me just sitting there flipping through nothing. So I shut off all notifications. You can go onto, into your phone and you can, you can set it so that it cannot email you so that it cannot send you messages. It can't push notifications to your phone. You can do that. And I challenge you to do that. We will limit checking any form of social media to once per day, no more than five to 10 minutes at a time. We, we want to greatly cut down the amount of time we spend on social media. We have it. We have various, we are on various platforms. Honestly, most of them, I can't stand them and don't like them anyways. I do enjoy seeing what my friends are doing and what's going on in their lives. <laughs> but again, remember, that's what they're showing me. Those are the ideas that they're pushing at that point in time. That's not necessarily really what's going on in their lives. And so what would be better is to be talking with them or engaging them and finding out what's really going on on a personal basis rather than trying to figure it out online. Make certain you are interacting with within the real world, not a false sense of reality built on shallow internet terms. Relationships are, in a sense, networks of protection built around us. For instance, boys that desire to know a girl should also get to know her family, friends, church, etc. Too often, perverse members of the selfie generation lure a girl into recluse online chats through social media. She may be in a state of depression. Her selfies are not performing well. <laughs> Something may be going on in her life that, that has caused her to be upset, be it to be a little down. These things are normal. To have the ups and downs of life, that's just how it is. You don't need something to rob you from dealing with those things or giving you a false sense of security when something serious may actually be going on. We need to be alert. We need to be sober. We need to be taking care of whatever it is that's going on in our life. But young ladies young men as well, but for purposes of the example, young ladies who tend to be emotional at times and be controlled at times uh, more so by their emotions than men tend to be, they have ups and downs. And if she's online and, and she, te she has to, happens to be in one of the down times in her life, and maybe she's a little upset or maybe slightly depressed or has a little anxiety about something, the predatory male lures her into a chat where he tells her everything her depressed heart desires, whatever she wants to know, how beautiful she is, how great she is, how wonderful she is. And that might seem like a wonderful thing. And it is if it's coming from the right person, if it's coming from the, the right and proper relationship, establish the right and proper way. 
But if it's someone trying to manipulate you and they know that they can take advantage of you online, then that's not a good thing. He is able to use the secret chat to manipulate her. This is a digital trap that can easily become a physical nightmare, all facilitated by social media platforms. Navigating real physical social networks that come with each individual person protect those involved from being too seriously manipulated. This is the idea. If that person has to come to your front door and your father answers, well, that's going to change the dynamics pretty quickly. Or if he comes to the front door and your best friend answers, or if someone else in life that has some say in the situation that can make some suggestions about the situation can act as a buffer between you and the person that's trying to manipulate you, you can be greatly helped. But when you get isolated online and that, that person is able to have their way with you and manipulate you, well, now you've got a serious problem and you're heading in a dangerous direction. Digital or physical, we should be wary of individuals that need us alone to get to know us. Why can't they meet your father or your mother or your friends or your teachers or your pastor or, or someone in your life that you interact with on a regular basis that knows you and would immediately know if this is someone that should or should not be around? It's important to have those relationships. It's very bad if you have removed yourself from all those relationships. You're in serious danger. Is it not odd to you that they desire to stay away from the people that care about you? That should be a sign that something's going on. If they want to speak to you online, make them do it publicly. Make them post it in, on a, in a public uh, a platform, a public chat where, where other people can see it. And if they have no ill intentions, then, then that'll be made very clear. If they do have ill inten intentions, then uh, other people can engage and <laughs> create some controversy together. <laughs> you need these layers of protection. And physical, real physical relationships are proper layers of protection. And you need those in your life. You don't want to be without them. The antidote to the shallow, self-indulged world of fake social media relationships is, a, is real relationships with real people. It's like, wow, that was deep. Well, how's that going in your life? Do you have real people around you that you could talk to, that know you, that would be honest with you, that can help you, that... Or have you so isolated yourself from real people that all you have is an online imaginary world of people you've hardly met or, or have never met at all? We do have friends that live all over the world. It is a point of connection for us to stay in touch with them. Real people that we actually know and can't physically follow up with. Well, it's nice for that. But outside of that, you need real people in your life that you interact with on a daily basis. My wife and I are always together and we love it. We enjoy it. And she can be honest about, with me about something that's going on in my life. And I can be honest with her about something that's going on in her life. I've had problems in my life or I've had issues or I've had decisions to make or whatever the case may be that I could call a friend that knows me and that sees me on a regular basis, like in person, not online, but actually in person. And I can talk to them and get some help and get some direction and, and, and they know me well enough to be able to, to make proper suggestions about what's going on in my life. This is important. People that you have met and actually interact with on a regular basis are extremely important. Of course, the answer to the internal emptiness that regularly haunts you is Jesus Christ. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Nobody loves you like Jesus Christ. Nobody desires a relationship with you like Jesus Christ. Now, you may not believe that, but have you looked into it? Have you tried to find out? You'll establish imaginary fake relationships with people that want to harm you online, but you won't consider a relationship with the Savior of the world who died for you, who loved you enough to shed his blood for you. I'd say there's something inordinate about that. There's something a little bit backwards about that. Relationships come with responsibility. You must be willing to put in the effort necessary to maintain their health. They can't just exist. You've got to participate in them. There, there has to be a measure of participation that shows the other person you place some value in that relationship. It can't just be there and say, well, we're friends because we have just said that we're friends. We're friends because we interact and we do that which is necessary to maintain the relationship. To just say something verbally doesn't make it so. Quick fly-by-night relationships are often predatory and destructive offering no fulfillment or value. Jesus Christ loves you so much that he chose to die for you. 
He promised to never leave you nor forsake you. And that relationship is available to you at any point in time, should you so desire it. You will find no greater love than his love for your soul. There is no greater offer for a real relationship than his sacrificial death in your place. The Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5 verse 8. Now, the antidote to the destructive doctrine of self-esteem is to follow the biblical prescription of esteeming others above yourself. The world around us encourages esteeming self at all costs, even in destructive situations. In the end, they find self keeps letting them down. A proper biblical estimation of man is necessary. Job 5, 7 says, yet man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. So it's man's natural disposition to be in trouble. Job 14, 1 says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Psalm 144, verse 4 says, man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. The Bible is very clear. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We are all in need of the help of the Savior, Jesus Christ. He is your only hope. He's your only true hope. To some extent, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you can, you can, uh, you can help yourself in some ways, but ultimately, Jesus Christ is where your hope is. We need the fruit of the Holy Spirit and we need the great foundational teachings of the Word of God. I beseech you, that means I beg you, escape the emptiness of this selfie generation and join yourself to a life of great meaning and duty in Jesus Christ. You will never forget it. You will never regret it. Now, I'm going to place some links below. A friend of mine, his name is Lee Cadenhead, preached a series of sermons dealing with social media and certain aspects of digital connectivity. I'm going to place those links in the description below. I hope you'll take some time to listen to him as a follow-on to this. He is a, a good friend of mine. I love him dearly and appreciate him. You'll not hear another man preach the way he does. He, he is a ball of fire, but he, he can so clearly and passionately convey truth. I encourage you to take the time to listen to it. I'd like to take the time to thank you for listening to these broadcasts. It's been a blessing to provide them for you. If you have other ideas or topics you'd like to read essays on or, or hear a broadcast of this sort discussing, uh, please comment below or email me or contact me in some way and let me know. I'd be happy to research it and, and write out an essay on it and, and try and determine the, uh, the value of putting it online and, and getting it out to be a help to people. Jesus Christ is God. He died on the cross. He died for our sins. This world needs him. <laughs> And as much as they need him, they need attachment to truth. And it is my hope to try and provide that truth in some meaningful way. Thank you again. You can visit our website at plenteousredemption.com. God bless you and thank you.